thanks. Um, Beijing Hackfest reminder to register. Um, Todd, I don't know what the registration is. I don't think I've registered. I know I'm going, but uh, um, so we want to do that. And then again, you know, as, as uh, we usually say, you know, feel free to go in and, and add things to the agenda. And we'll, um, we obviously we run these as sort of an unconference um, when we get there and see who's there and who wants to discuss what, but it helps to put things out there and, and sort of help to spark some discussion. Um, <clears throat> Add certification update. We now have uh, Sawtooth and Fabric at 100% and Aroha very close at 97. And I know Dave is, is working with the teams there. Um, and so we have two um, discussions. Uh, the first is um, for Dave to review um, his revised uh, draft process for security handling um, uh, CVEs. And um, and then there's the top level versus sub project discussion. I don't know if Brian is on. Um, I don't think so. I don't think he is. So if he's not on, then I guess we're going to defer that, which means we just have the one discussion, Dave. All right. I'm trying to see if I can share my screen. If not, you guys will probably have to pull up the draft on your own. Sorry. I, my, I was delayed three hours getting out of New York last night. We didn't take off until almost midnight Eastern time, which means that I landed about three hours ago. <laughs> um, so Dave, oddly, it will not allow me to give you presenter rights. I've not seen that before, so I don't know what. Yeah, I, I've, well, been, I've been letting him have presenter. <laughs> I'm I'm calling it what I'm accessing it from my phone here, but I was trying to do it from my laptop as well. Um, so there, now I'm in. It says you do not. Dave, uh, would you mind posting a link to the draft in chat? Uh, yes. Hold on a second. Why am I getting recorded twice? Hey, you're echoing. Something has to be muted. There. Okay. Um, it says now that it's waiting to view your screen, so maybe you can share now. Uh, yeah, except I'm on a Chromebook, and this isn't. Uh, Don't worry right, about I'll, it, then. We'll we'll get the link. Yeah, okay. All right, we got links in chat now. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, right, Dave, you're up. I know. All right. So um, uh, this ties back to the earlier point that the CII badge is in process for our three main projects, our graduated projects. Um, part of the security section for getting your core infrastructure initiative badge was that you needed to have a documented process for handling security bugs. Um, and the teams that are at 100% I have advised them to just point back to this document and the wiki that say we are we have a process or you know we are going to follow a process um, and then I told them that as long as we got this process into place before we went to 1.0 that everything would be fine um, so this the security bug proposal um, is nothing new this is nothing I invented um, generally the the philosophy behind this is that we just wanted to all agree on um, one way to cooperate on these security bugs. It, it doesn't make sense for all of us to have our own committees, our own groups of people handling um, security bugs, um, mostly because I wanted to spread the load out. Uh, one of the CII badge or requirements is that each team identifies one engineer that has secure programming experience. And um, would I think that's all it says, secure programming experience. Um, I want to leverage that list of engineers to build a committee that will review the um, confidential security bug reports. Uh, the plan being that as they come in, we would all get together, we would triage them, anything we thought was, uh, we, would, we would probably investigate them, and anything we thought was a real um, serious security flaw, we would then 
pull in other engineers from the affected project on a need to know basis and work with them uh, quietly and quickly to come up with a fix for them. Uh, then the next round of uh, once we have a, a fix that we all agree on, then we would reach out to any vulnerable large installs um, and give them a heads up so that we could deploy the fix before it's announced publicly. And then um, once we have all that in place, then we will go through the normal CVE process um, of announcing the uh, uh, the disclosure or yeah disclosing the the vulnerability as well as cutting a new release that includes the fix. Um, as you can see, most of this document is basically a, the Apache project's vulnerability handling procedure, handling procedure. I went through all of theirs, and I'm I'm exceedingly happy with how it is. It's essentially the same as what we did at um, Mozilla, and it's also pretty much the same we did at Linden Lab. So I have lots of experience with these processes. Um, I, I just really wanted to put it in front of the technical steering committee because at some point the TSC is going to have to approve this. Um, the key highlights here are that we will have team members from each of the major projects. Um, bug reporting is confidential. I have we have already set up the security email, um, the security at hyperledger.org email reporting. Um, I'm also working with Rye to enable um, security groups um, in JIRA. So security groups in JIRA allow uh, the broader community to report a JIRA and to flag it as a security critical bug. And when it's flagged as a security critical bug, it is kept confidential. Um, the only people that can access it would be the members of this security triage group. Um, and I'm working on a solution for GitHub for the teams that are on GitHub. And um, I'm still looking at uh, all of the projects to see and make sure that they're either on GitHub or Jira. So, let me see, let me distill it down to the points of discussion. One, uh, there is, I would like to have a standing committee of security oriented engineers where we meet on a regular basis um, to triage incoming security bug reports. So that's gonna need TSC approval. Two, um, I've already put into place or I'm putting into place uh, confidential bug reporting and handling. And three, this document here is going to be the document of record for how we are going to handle things, which includes, um, which includes the process for responsible disclosure of vulnerabilities. So, at, now that I'm at that point, I guess I'll open it up for discussion. <clears throat> so, this is Chris. Um, you're you're looking for just one or a minimum of one from each project? A minimum of one. Um, okay. Ideally, I'd like to keep this committee as small as possible. It, uh, hopefully, we're not getting a lot of security bug reports. Um, well, it really only, it only, right. only needs to be three or four, right? I mean, right. I, I was just thinking that you might want to have a minimum of two because people go out, they go on vacation, or they're not reachable, and there's something critical. Yeah, yeah, OK. Um, sure. I guess we could have a, a primary and an alternate. I I don't want it to be a big. Uh, yeah, no, I, 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 understand. I understand. And you got eight projects now and more coming. I'm just suggesting that there be some sort yeah. of a phone tree at least to. Yeah, that's actually really good feedback. Um, that's actually a good idea. I think we should do that. We can I, I, each of the teams can identify a primary and an alternate. Um, and the idea is that we would meet on a regular basis, but obviously if a report comes in that looks really scary, um, I will I could potentially call a meeting on a short notice. Um, and also, uh, I don't want to be the leader of this meeting. I will be a part of the meeting, but um, I will I would like the the security triage group to elect uh, <clears throat> elect somebody to be the moderator, the person who calls the meetings and runs it. Um, and we will also take extensive notes as we go through the, the bug triage process, right? So it'll probably be recorded in the confidential bug handling system for um, full transparency once it's disclosed. 
Okay. And um, Hart had a comment. Hart, you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, I was just curious what exactly we were defining as security bugs, because for something like an OS, right, it's relatively straightforward what's a security bug and what's not. Uh, for a piece of blockchain software, it's not necessarily so clear, because um, something that impacts certain aspects of the performance might be might be you know disastrous for some applications. Um, do you have kind of uh, a guideline as to what you might consider a, a security bug and and what wouldn't be one. And my question there was a bug in a consensus algorithm. Would that be a security bug or not? Um, well, I think the rough definition is that any bug that allows some non or non trusted actor or, or you know I guess even a trusted actor in a permission network to adversely affect the functioning of the network that would be considered a, a security bug. So yeah, a bug in a consensus algorithm that's preventing it from coming to consensus, for sure, would be a security bug. Now, the, the triage committee would look at these and decide whether it's a critical security vulnerability or not. And for something like a consensus algorithm problem, you know, it, it, it's really up to the committee to decide. It could be something where it's like, oh, well, we're, we're not able to get our throughput that we want because there's a problem in the algorithm. So maybe we'll just kick this out as a critical bug and and let the project handle it. But if there's a, a bug in the consensus algorithm that allows people to like DDoS the entire network and prevent it from functioning at all, I would consider that to be a critical security bug. And so we would um, uh, we would deal with that quickly and confidentially because we wouldn't want to reveal the ability to shut down an established credentialed network. Okay, sure. I see what you're saying. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, just if you if you define things really liberally, then kind of any bug on a blockchain practically can be a security bug. But if we have people who are following them very quickly and kind of measuring the impact, then we shouldn't be overwhelmed by security bugs. At least that's the hope. Yeah, I think it'll be pretty clear. I think the vast majority of these bugs are going to be bugs that our remote code executions, you know, uh, they're going to be attacks on the uh, IPC layer, you know, remote access attacks, those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, we will de uh, deal with bugs on things like consensus algorithms and even smart contracts as well. I think th this is why we have a committee and this is why we meet on a regular basis. And as we move forward, we're going to get good at being able to spot what is and isn't a, a security bug. Um, it's hard to define it right now, obviously, right? But it's general rule of thumb is, is there, um, it do, does this bug allow the network to be shut down or to be adversely affected um, by somebody who hasn't been trusted with the ability to do that, right? Um, would it be helpful to look at um, what Ethereum and Bitcoin have done in response to those in order to get an idea about what, um, uh, kind of appropriate response to algorithmic bugs would be. Yeah, that's actually a good idea. Um, yeah, so the Ethereum one is specifically, right? The DAO was a really interesting test case for um, smart contract uh, bugs, right? So uh, I guess we could go through. I, I could go through it, and I can put in uh, references to that in the notes um, to help give broader definition or a narrow definition to what a security bug is. Okay. It just seems like, um, you know, building on somebody else's experience specifically with, with the kind of problems we'd see with blockchain might be useful. It's uh, Marta here. Also, I think that we are very early uh, stage in general with blockchain and uh, we haven't seen attacks. So we will just uh, learn as we go. It's, it's hard to define what a blockchain bug is. A lot of it will be just implementation problems, but uh, as we move forward, we'll just spot bugs because they, we will see attacks. So putting definitions today will be hard because well, some of them are easily defined. We know that, that there is a potential for DDoS or potential for 51% uh, attack, but some of them will be just, well, we'll just have to face it. and. As Brian said yesterday, 
I we we kind of will be we, we will know that we're doing a good job when once people will start attacking us because that means that we're interesting. Yeah, I agree with that. I think largely what we're going to see is implementation errors at, at first, um, and then we'll later on be become experts on <laughs> smart contract bugs. I think as we start finding more and more of those. Um, uh, to augment this process, I we are also putting into place security scans, security audits, and uh, continuous fuzzing um, for the various projects to try to get out of, out ahead of any implementation errors. Um, the reason Iroha is only at ninety seven percent with their CII badge is because they are a memory unsafe language C plus plus, and I'm working closely with them to get American Fuzzy Lock in place, which is um, which is notorious for finding uh, bugs, you know, implementation bugs in memory unsafe languages. Um, if you look at the trophy case for American Fuzzy Lop, it's things like um, libfssl, uh, the Apache web server, the Linux kernel, like previously undiscovered uh, implementation flaws that had been in the code bases for many, many years. So um, that's the fuzzer that I've been going with with them, and I'm exploring options for. Sawtooth and Fabric as well, because there are Python and Go adapters for uh, American Fuzzy Lock as well. Um, so hopefully, we're, I mean, we're taking a proactive stance on security here. We're trying to get out ahead of it. And it's about time we start standing up the, the committee to deal with um, security bugs, because we're going to start finding them from the fuzzing too. So um, yeah. Are you going to be able to deal with um or will the committee deal with like a SSL bug that that's not in our code per se, but can be used to to do something malicious to us? Will we have to address? You know, we'll, sort of like a gray area, right? Yeah. So the answer to that is absolutely. If we find a security vulnerability and we trace it out to um, an external library like OpenSSL. Um, we would immediately contact the security team on OpenSSL and we would work closely together with them. We would make the report to them and then the way it's always happened in open source is when you have an external security report, that person becomes sort of uh, the primary resource for investigation. It's like, okay, walk us through the, you know, how you did it, you know, walk us through uh, how you can trigger the flaw, that kind of stuff. So we would work very closely with that external team security um, team to do it. Now, not all open, so open source libraries have security teams. So in those cases, we would become the de facto security team for that open source library. So we would probably try to fix the solution or fix the problem and then feed it into their community in a responsible way. Right. But I was actually thinking of the other case. If like, uh, you know, somebody else reports outside of Hyperledger, but, you know, open SSL bug is reported. Um, you know, does the committee meet to figure out the impact? Yes, yes, that's the answer okay. too. So yeah, if we're affected by something that's not responsibly disclosed, for sure, we will have to come up with a, a response on a on quick notice. Um, but okay. most of these foundational libraries, like S Open SSL, have a confidential security reporting process for responsible disclosure, and it's likely that we would be, well, I, you know. It was likely we would be included in the confidential reporting because I part of this committee would be to reach out to those core pieces that we do rely on and let them know that we are a major install of their software. So if they get something that we should know about, you know, that they're trying to handle responsibly, let us know so that we can respond. Um, yeah. Would that? Sorry, this has been. Um, Borough, we have an obvious, so, so our team split in two and the consensus engine is built by Tenement. Um, would that work in two directions that we would also report to Tenement um, if, if bugs would be found there? Yes. Or, or how would you envision that relationship is to be structured? I mean, we have a close relationship, but there's probably some value in thinking of how that um, well, should be structured. So security, uh, Response teams are kind of like a, it's you know, for lack of a better term, like a secret society. <laughs> they tend to be very small, and we all tend to know each other. And so it, it's very much like you want to reach out to the security team that manages 
major pieces that you rely on and vice versa offer yourself up like you know if there's going to be a major install of fabric somewhere and they have in-house security say hey we'd like to get our security teams in touch um, and to establish some kind of you know understanding that we'll let each other know um, security has gotten to be such a big deal in the last 10 years that this is not new right most security teams all eventually start to know each other and we have uh, secure back channels between all of us um, this is just us forming our committee and then joining that broader community that already exists uh, I know from my experience at Mozilla we had back channels from our security teams to you know probably two dozen other groups um, both libraries and users like the Tor browser project for instance was the one I was most heavily involved in we traded security vulnerabilities back and forth right um, so yeah w this is us forming our committee and this is us you know stepping up and joining the broader community that exists so that we can be part of the responsible disclosure process This is Ram. Um, on the question of uh, how do we classify security vulnerabilities, you know, are there any uh, other uh, examples where threat models or threat frameworks uh, uh, are put in place to kind of analyze, uh, you know, um, more proactively, you know, what parts uh, of the system would be vulnerable? Now, this is a, a, a conversation we've had, you know, Hart uh, and, and others. Uh, you know, how do we kind of get a little bit more proactive from a security analysis uh, perspective, given that, you know, uh, for distributed ledgers, that's a very important, in, in enterprise applications, that's going to be a very important consideration. So, to answer that question, that's what I was hoping to get out of um, as a consequence of the sec outside security audits that are underway with some of the projects, or at least a, will be shortly. Um, a lot of outside security auditing firms are very good at doing um, threat modeling and doing analysis on identifying the pieces that are probably the most vulnerable or the you know pieces that need the most scrutiny. Um, that's not necessarily the security committee's job, although curating those as we go forward um, would be part of that. Um, and it would actually fall more under the secure programmer, the secure uh, programming expert that each team has identified. I think that role for each of the teams would be curating the threat model and doing more analysis on the code base. I mean, that's what it means to be a secure programming expert. Um, that's part of that job. So to bootstrap us into having done the analysis, I was going to rely on the outside security auditing teams and to work closely with them to come up with good threat models for these uh, applications. Um, and then moving forward, just having the expert on each team help curate it. And um, I believe the core infrastructure initiative badge requires um, some major analysis um, and review for every major release. So going through the process again, not necessarily with an outside security audit, but going through the threat model and and making sure that you know all the new stuff that has been rewritten gets a full security review on it before it goes out the door. Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, that does. Uh, you know, I think it'll be good to kind of see whether we can capture the learnings from the threat modeling uh, that can be shared between projects as well, right? Um, you know, maybe uh, longer term, we can have uh, a sh you, you know a common framework for the threat models for distributed ledgers, perhaps. But you know, it'd be good to kind of figure out how we can uh, consolidate the learnings, if you will. Yeah, um, the I don't there's I don't think that there's any reason to keep the threat modeling secret. So I see all of this as being part of the public documentation, um, and you know. I guess the, the security triage group could facilitate that, but I, the way I view it is there's two sides to this, right? It's like we're kind of like the fire department. There are fire inspectors, right? That, that would be the people doing the security audits and the, the, the experts for each of the teams doing the analysis work. 
And then there are the EMTs and the first responders, the people who go to a fire and try to put the fire out. That would be the, the um, security triage uh, group, okay? So they're, they're very distinct, um, <clears throat> a very distinct set of responsibilities. The triage group is really just a, an emergency response team. And it's kind of like a volunteer fire department, whereas the other group that takes a lot more work are the fire inspectors, right? The people going through the code, making sure we're not introducing new bugs. Got it. So, Thanks. Yeah. And the secrecy levels are different, right? Because of the different posture they take. So, I mean, any other questions? Because um, uh, I don't, I don't intend to <clears throat> call for a vote today, but in the very near future, probably next week or the week after, I'd like to put this to the committee um, for approval, both to create a standing security triage group and to adopt this as our process for handling um, security vulnerabilities. <clears throat> what is outside the scope of this is. Um, mandating the threat modeling because the CII badge requirement mandates that as part of the security review. I don't think this is that's within the scope of this proposal, um, but it is related. So um, it's good that we had the discussion here. I'd encourage people to comment in the, the Google Docs um, because over the next week or so I, we can shape the languaging of it before it goes to the committee for approval. But that's it. I mean, if nobody else had any questions, I, thanks for your time. Get some sleep. <laughs> I'm already <clears throat> asleep. <laughs> so, do we have? I guess we don't have a quorum, right, Todd? No, no. Uh, we're we're quite shy from quorum. Okay. So um, then, what I would suggest, since I didn't hear, I mean, I, I think there was some good feedback there, Dave. Um, I think there's maybe a couple of nits that you can do to tweak the proposal for, you know, having a backup and so forth. And yep, for sure, you know, defining what you know what we mean by a security defect um yep a little more yep. precisely and then um, <clears throat> um since next week is also a holiday week in the u.s todd i would suggest that we dave that you just send it out and todd you just call for a vote by email just so that we can get this moving okay for next week yeah okay so to, cool. I, I just I'm worried that, you know, because of the holiday, I think that's why we're shy this week as well. But, you know, we have a holiday in the U.S. coming up on Monday and um, okay. many people will be, you know, going to the Cape or whatever for their yeah. um, Memorial Day weekend. And um, I so, so we may we may be shy next week as well, is all I'm saying. So I would sure. just suggest that we just do this by my by mail as opposed to waiting for us to get quorum up. Okay, sounds good. I'll make the tweaks. I'll put in some more references um, of all the things people had suggested. And um, yeah, uh, it'll hit the mailing list soon. Awesome. Thanks, Dave, for all the effort. And um, give every actually, one, one thing to Mark, you joined the call and, and um, I think it might be worthwhile to give yourself uh, an intro, give, give the, the, the TSC and others on the call an intro. Was it for me? Yes, yes, for you, Marta. Oh, sorry, yeah. So, well, I, I guess I met some of you or most of you during consensus, uh, but just to yeah, give, uh, give a quick intro. Uh, my name is Marta Vikarska. I'm Director of Ecosystem uh, for Hyperledger. I was announced uh, on Monday, uh, but I've been working with Hyperledger for the last three weeks. Uh, Brian hired me to uh do three things uh though pretty big ones uh for uh first and foremost i'm responsible for managing and building relationships with our existing members and reaching out to new members what that means is that um i, I would like to uh, launch a program where i help uh, our existing members uh to uh, better navigate our uh, projects, our ecosystem, and help them um, figure out and uh, understand how they can uh, get the best uh, experience with uh, Hyperledger projects and uh, other members. So I'll be reaching out to all of our members to uh, have a quick chat with them. Uh, 
uh, understand what were what, what was the motivation uh, to join Hyperledger and understand how can uh, we get, we can get uh, involved uh, in what they're doing and how can they get involved uh, in what Hyperledger is doing, uh, looking at you know building connections between members, building connections uh, with the projects and introducing them to the projects because quite often we see that they only you know about one or two of out of all eight projects. And uh, I'll be also responsible for uh, overlooking uh, the working groups that we're uh, launching. So we already have the identity working group, the healthcare working group. We are working uh, to build and soon announce uh, the uh, insurance working group. And that, that is the model that we will be pushing forward to kind of uh, make sure that uh, members are working together uh, on new projects. Second thing is I'm responsible for building relationship with our community. Uh, so the open source developers, uh, uh, organizing meetups, making sure that people all around the world understand that we are very proud of our community and we know that uh, Hyperledger would be very different if it wasn't for the volunteers that developed for us um, and uh, this foundation of open source. Uh, and then the third thing that I'm doing is I'm Brian's uh, substitute and backup humble backup when it comes to going to conferences and giving talks so yeah and i'm based in cambridge uk so if you ever would like to meet me just uh reach out on marla at, uh, at linuxfoundation.org and um, i would be very happy to meet you, meet you in london or cambridge great <clears throat> yeah. oh and i have background in security and privacy if you ever wonder if I can code, yes, I can code and I understand security and privacy. So when I sometimes back up Dave on his comments and security, that's why. Sign her up, Dave. <laughs> I, I can actually vouch for that um, because uh, Marta and I did work very closely together uh, back when I worked for Mozilla and she was um, a PhD student at TU Berlin working for Deutsche Telekom doing um, research in privacy. So. We've known each other for a few years, and I, I plus one everything she just asserted. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, and welcome, Marta. Very good. Everyone Thank else, you. Uh, give you uh, 24 minutes back. So, Thank you. Else. I am already asleep. Bye, guys. Yeah. Cheers. Sleep time. Cheers. <laughs>